for this DAS RCN meeting, I'm going to share some of the results um, of experiments that we've been working on here at Oregon State. Um, I am a postdoc working with Megan Wengrove. Um, and today, Marcella Ifu, who is a first year graduate student, is also going to share some of the results of uh, her work, which will be uh, part of her master's and or PhD. Um, and we have also been working with uh, Rob Holman and Kara Walter here at Oregon State, as well as Nate Lindsay, who's at Fiber Sense. Um, so just to give you an idea of what I'm going to talk about today, um, I'm just going to provide like a very brief introduction to how we've been thinking about DAS as an instrument to monitor nearshore processes, um, and then um, dive into our results. Um, and then I'll hand it over to Marcella to for her to share some of her work, um, and then uh, discuss some future directions and open it up for questions. Um, and since it is a very small group, really feel free to inter interrupt me at any point if you want me to talk more about anything. Um, I'm just sort of going to cover like a bunch of different things in shallow detail. Um, so as all of you know, DAS records a wide range of oceanographic signals. Um, there are many telecom cables that are installed in the ocean um, that are buried in the seafloor, um, and they can be used to track acoustic signals like ship traffic and whales, um, as well as uh, seismic signals. Um, but we are more interested in studying the um, ocean physics that can also be recorded on these cables. Um, so our, our main overarching research goal is really to quantify the capability of DAS um, as a nearshore sensing tool. Um, and so in general, we have been thinking about sort of like the shallower end, perhaps um, more shallow than some of the other projects that we've heard about um, in the RCN um, and really thinking about the uh, region where uh, a surface gravity wave is producing a uh, pressure gradient on the seafloor that is directly impacting on the cable and producing a strain signal um, like this cartoon shown here. Um, and so we can think about um, what DAS is actually recording um, and DAS is measuring the total strain over a uh, gauge length. Um, and so that will essentially be the um, total strain introduced by the pressure gradient over that channel length. Um, and so the recorded strain will depend on the gauge length, the wave characteristics, as well as cable characteristics like um, the composition of the cable, the burial depth, the temperature, and things like that. Um, so there are a lot of variables sort of to be um, accounting for in this process of using DAS to quantify surface gravity waves. Um, and all of you, I think, know all of this. Um, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir, um, but essentially we're interested in using DAS to look quantitatively at waves. We want to be able to look at the amplitude, the wavelength, and the period. Um, and so, so far I've been showing sort of a diagram of like a single wave, but really we know that in the ocean, we're really dealing with like a spectrum of waves. Um, so we want to be able to use DAS to look at um, these sort of like bulk wave statistics. Um, so um, our, our more specific research goals in trying to quantify the capability of DAS as an oceanographic sensing tool um, is to create a transfer function from strain to a more relevant parameter like um, pressure or bed shear stress that we can relate to um, wave or nearshore processes. Um, and then uh, further spatially and temporally correlate um, signals that we see on the seabed with um, water column or sea surface signals. Um, and Marcella will talk a little bit about her work on that. And so we have four different data sets that we have collected that we're using to think about these research questions. 
Um, and I'm only really going to talk about one of them today, um, but I'll just give a brief introduction to all four. Um, so we have collected data um, from four very different environments um, with different cable types um, so that we can look at sort of like the wide range of DAS capabilities um, in uh, November to 2021 to February 2022, we collected data at the Army Corps um, Field Research Facility in Duck, North Carolina, where we installed a telecom cable um, and had a bunch of co-located instruments. Um, and then in December, we collected data at the Wave Lab here at Oregon State, um, where we could look at um, a bunch of different cable types experiencing the same very controlled wave conditions. So we could compare response um, across a bunch of different cable types, um, as well as look at like the, the real details of um, wave properties. Um, and then in uh, September of 2022, we collected data on a telecom cable that runs from uh, Florence, Oregon up to Alaska. Um, and we were just looking out to the first repeater, so at the first like 50 kilometers of the cable, um, but in slightly deeper water um, up to about like, I think, maximum depth of maybe 70 meters. Um, and Marcel will talk a little bit about that. And then um, Recently, most recently, we went and collected data um, at the cable that connects Kilonalu Observatory to shore um, in Honolulu, Hawaii. And we're looking in relatively shallow water um, on a reef where there's a cable sort of not as much buried as um, laid directly on coral and on the seafloor. And so we can um, really look at a very wide range of conditions um, and explore the full capabilities of DAS. Um, today, I am going to talk about um, this project in Duck, North Carolina, um, and then Marcella will talk about uh, our project in Florence, Oregon. Um, so I'm just going to dive into um, explaining a little bit about the setup of our experiment and then some of our results in uh, Duck. Um, so I'm I imagine everyone here is familiar with the field research facility. Um, it's a great um, site. It's a, it's a beach and near shore environment that's been monitored since the 70s. Um, the Army Corps maintains a wonderful suite of instrumentation there. Um, and so it's a great place to both study inertia processes and also develop new technology. Um, because you can ground truth against a lot of different types of existing instrumentation. Um, so for the work that I'm going to talk about today specifically, um, there are some instruments deployed on the seafloor um, across shore as shown along this transect here. Um, so we have direct measurements of um, pressure and wave statistics and currents. Um, from our perspective, the only thing that uh, was missing was a fiber optic cable. Um, so Megan went out and worked with the folks um, at the field research facility to install a telecom cable. Oops. Um, uh, and so they they um, ran it from the dune toe um, out across shore to about 14, 15 meters water depth. Um, and uh, they buried it in the beach and then uh, laid it offshore using an amphibious vehicle, um, and the cable was weighted to self-bury in the sand. Um, and you can see the, the general bathymetry here, um, where um, the, the slope of the beach is fairly, and the near shore region is fairly constant, um, and then there is also an offshore bar, which will come up later. Um, so just some details about the experiment. Um, uh, the cable was about 1,500 meters long. Um, we collected data from November to February, um, saving at a rate of 500 hertz. Um, and our channel spacing was just over three meters. So we had 552 sample locations through the cross shore and our gauge length was 4.8 meters. Um, and this was data collected with a scintilla onyx interrogator, which outputs uh, strain, not uh, strain rate. 
Hannah, can I ask a question? Is the yeah. dashed black line where you think the cable was? Is that like the initial position of the cable or? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So that's the bathymetry um, on the deployment date. Deployment date. Um, okay. Yeah. So you can see that the bar moves a little bit onshore over the winter. Do you have any way to know that it like stayed beneath the, I mean, that's, you're just assuming that any sediment transport that happens occurs on top of the cable? Yeah, um, we can clearly see over the first like week, um, the magnitude of the strain changes dramatically as the cable varies. Yeah. Um, and then after that, we don't see those same like significant changes in strain magnitude. Um, yeah. So we think that it was like, yeah roughly buried <laughs> okay cool. yeah but also bed for migration is like a whole thing that we'd love to look at eventually um so just to give you an idea of what um, a time stack of the data sort of generally looks like um this is the figure that i've just been showing on my outline slides um, where uh, offshore distance is on the x-axis and time is increasing on the y-axis. Um, and then strain is plotted as a uh, color. And you can see um, the strain signal drops off um, uh, right at the beach on the left-hand side here, um, where uh, the cable is no longer underneath water. Um, and we see waves arriving onshore as these propagating bands of compression and extension. Um, and we can see waves shoaling as they approach the shore. I'm also point out that we um, also see some optical fading, um, which is sort of like locations along the cable where we're relatively consistently seeing a drop in signal. Um, and then this actually this bad region here, just um, inside of 400 meters, um, is actually a location where there was a um, loop or kink in the cable when we deployed it. Um, and so that actually caused a whole mess of issues. Um, and some of our later data, especially offshore, is really corrupted by this loop location. And I th we think that the cable was actually damaged at one point. Um, but focusing on good data. Um, oh, yeah, Nate. I just asked, uh, so the, I guess I was wondering if you normalize like by channel, just the peak of that channel, if you see, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, if you see the coherency of that wave, if, if, if you can, then it's not optical fading as much as just weaker signal, um, which would be consistent with, with kind of like a kink like you're saying or a loop, maybe. Yeah, so there's like two different things. Yeah, so th this loop itself, we like definitely know it happened and it's very consistent through the whole time series, no matter what normalization we use, the data is just like really bad there. Um, yeah. yeah, but then there, there are other locations where we've actually talked to the scintilla folks about this a fair amount of like why we see these bands of lower magnitude um and sometimes they actually don't capture like wave phase very well and we're we're still not entirely sure like what exactly it is whether that's actually optical fading yeah um so here i'm showing um maybe exactly what you're bringing up um so this is like a I think Megan calls it a wiggle plot, <laughs> um, essentially just showing the, the normalize. So each um, channel time series is shown here with a arbitrary but uniform um, normalization just to emphasize the coherence between um, signals. And we can really watch those waves propagating onshore. Um, we can also see that uh, strain increases over the bar and at the shoreline as we'd expect. Um, and we just, we see those waves propagating really nicely across the cue ball. Um, I'll also point out that we see just some like fun signals um, that um, are also captured uh, through um, the use of cameras. Um, so there are these Argus cameras that are taking snapshots and um, long exposure time series photos of 
the beach. Um, and we can see the amphibious vehicle, the Lark, actually was driving up the beach at a time point when the camera captured it. Um, and right in this image is actually like essentially crossing right over where the cable was buried. Um, and if we look at that time of day and look at the strain, we can actually see um, the front axle and then the back axle of the vehicle passing over the cable, which is fun. Um, and so we actually used this image to help um, geo-reference the cable as we were determining exactly where channels were in space. Um, but mostly what I've been thinking about is creating this transfer function between strain and uh, pressure variance or dynamic pressure at the seabed. Um, and really our goal here is to use DAS to quantitatively measure wave height and period. Um, and so we can look at a time series from just a few channels um, here, um, and we can also look at the corresponding spectra. Um, and we see that um, even without any normalization, um, there is a, a peak in energy um, at a frequency corresponding to about seven second wave period, which is consistent with what we were observing just on that day, just in this specific example. Um, and uh, so even without any sort of like um, uh, calibration, we can get a fairly good idea of the dominant wave period using DAS. Um, but we're more interested really in using um, DAS to quantify wave height, which is slightly more challenging. And that's where we really need to be able to convert from strain to a more useful parameter like pressure. Um, so um, for this experiment, we did this using um, an empirical calibration um, where we're assuming that there's a linear relationship between the pressure and the strain um, and that we can calculate that uh, coefficient using co-located instrumentation. So we have a pressure sensor, an AWAC, um, located near the cable, and we can look at the strain signal recorded at the nearest channel. Um, and in order to calculate this coefficient, we need to take into account both uh, the frequency dependence as well as the channel location dependence. And that really comes back to the fact that DAS is integrating total strain over a gauge length, which means that the ratio between the wavelength and the gauge length is going to impact the strain that is recorded. Um, so our correction factor needs to be frequency dependent. Um, and then also our strain is going to vary with water depth um, as well as cable burial and uh, cable temperature. Um, and so we calculated a correction factor for each channel location using the nearest AWAC. Um, so just to give you an idea of what sort of that calibration process looks like, um, we can calculate a spectra for the strain shown here in red on the left axis um, and for pressure from the nearest AWAC um, shown here on the right axis in black. Um, and you can see that in general, once again, the strain is capturing the wave period pretty well, um, but the magnitudes are very different, obviously. Um, so we can calculate the ratio between these two to correct strain to pressure. Um, and here I'm showing just for a single channel, um, a bunch of those correction factors um, colored by the um, time when they were calculated. I um, mean, we can see that there's a fair amount of spread in that correction factor over time. Um, we're still sort of exploring all the reasons that that correction might change through time. Um, but the, the overall shape is fairly consistent, especially in the incident band uh, where we've been looking at trying to correct between uh, strain and pressure. Um, and so we take a, a median value over time um, and calculate a single correction for each channel, which is it's a frequency dependent relationship. Um, and so we can take that correction factor and now calculate a DAS-derived pressure spectra. Um, and then we can use that spectra to calculate bulk wave statistics. Um, and overall, um, this method performs really well, which we were kind of surprised about. 
Um, so here I'm showing the result of using that gas derived pressure to calculate um, two wave uh, bulk wave parameters, um, significant wave height and peak wave period, um, where the red is from a single DAS channel, channel 450, which is pretty close to the 11 meter AWAC. Um, and then just two different methods for using the AWAC to calculate these same statistics. Um, you can see that the DAS does a really good job over a fairly wide range of dynamic conditions. Um, so uh, quite a range of wave periods and wave heights. Um, and uh, one of the things that we were interested in was sort of like how much calibration data do you actually need to get this correction factor to um, give you a good wave height? Um, so we did some uh, variation of the amount of calibration data, um, as well as uh, doing some uh, cross validation um, to really sort of like calculate bulk or uh, robust statistics to evaluate the performance of these correction factors. Um, and here I'm showing uh, the performance as R squared and root mean squared error um, as a function of the amount of calibration data that was input. Um, so uh, you can see, especially for the slightly deeper channels, um, the performance for uh, significant wave height um, reaches a peak somewhere between like 10 and 14 days. Um, so having a pressure sensor out for over a week um, results in optimal performance. And after that, it sort of doesn't matter how much calibration data you have. Um, though also point out that once again, the period um, can be calculated um, relatively accurately with very little calibration or no calibration possibly even. Um, Do you, I mean, that, that's also must be a big function of the variability of your wave conditions, right? I mean, yeah. like if you had I don't know, hypothetically, like six days from like very different parts of the year with very different waves, maybe that would be better than six days in sequence. But I mean, I don't know. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, so yeah, this data was taken from um, variable periods from November where we had like a really wide range of wave conditions. So that probably also really helps. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So this, when you used like shorter periods in this example, there were sequential days, not like from selected from within that. They were randomly selected time periods from within this interval. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it might still be better than like six sequential days or something. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which and I guess we didn't we really <laughs> like specifically dive into um, whether using like sequential days or random days was better. Um, but we just happened to have like a pretty wide range of conditions through this time period. Yeah. Um, so one of the other things that we were really interested in was in addition to like how well DAS can perform through a range of wave height and period, also um, how does wave angle to the shoreline impact our data. Um, and interestingly, we see that at least within this sort of like constrained near shore environment, we don't see a strong impact of wave angle on our data. Um, so here I'm showing just the, the performance. Um, so on the x-axis, we have significant wave height from the AWAC, um, and on the Y is uh, significant wave height from the DAS, and same thing for period. Um, and this is just colored by mean wave angle to the shoreline. Um, and you can see that there isn't a strong um, relationship between um, fit and that wave angle. Um, and we also see this if we sort of like look at specific time periods where we see a significant change in wave angle to the shoreline. Um, where they're uh, here over um, November 19th to the 23rd or so, um, we see wave angles sort of going through the full range of extremes that we tend to observe in this type of environment. Um, but the performance of DAS in predicting wave height and period um, doesn't really change. Um, so in a constrained near shore environment where you're not going to probably have waves arriving at like a 90 degree angle to your cable, um, wave angle is less of a consideration, um, but not saying that it's not a consideration in more offshore applications. 
Um, so, so far I've been just showing you data from a single channel, um, but we know that DAS is really an array measurement fundamentally. Um, and so we can also use that to our advantage to collect really dense cross shore measurements through the near shore. Um, so here I'm showing once again, a time stack on the left and then on the right, um, the same data, but now in frequency wave number space, um, where we see that once again, DAS is capturing really nicely um, the waves uh, propagating on shore. Um, the lines, the black lines here shown are the um, dispersion curves for waves in the, the water depths um, of the input data. Um, all, what we also see in these time series um, is that we have both wave energy, I mean, most of the wave energy is propagating onshore, but we also do see um, wave reflection, um, including wave reflection in the incident band. Um, and so uh, typically when we're trying to calculate wave reflection, um, the measurement is limited by the number of pressure sensors that can be deployed across shore. Um, but here we have a whole bunch of pressure sensors essentially. Um, and so we can calculate wave reflection at many, many points through the near shore. Um, so um, this is something that we've been sort of exploring as like one of the possibly exciting applications of DAS as a near shore tool. Um, here I'm showing the um, ratio of reflected over incoming wave energy um, at uh, calculated um, centering on each channel across shore. Um, so for this analysis, I chose sets of five adjacent channels and used them to calculate um, incoming versus reflected wave energy. Um, and we can do this for um, every half hour or hour time period um, over time um, and really look at how much wave reflection, is, how much both the measurement itself is varying based on channels chosen, um, as well as the actual um, how much the, the coefficient is changing through time. Um, and so you can see that um, adjacent sets of channels um, reproduce with fairly high precision the same um, reflection coefficient. Um, and also, as we would expect, um, the reflection is highest um, both on the bar and right at the shoreline. Um, and we can do the same thing. So here I'm just showing, um, here I'm just showing a few hours um, as an example, um, but we can do the same thing for our entire time series and compare wave reflection to parameters like wave height and period um, to really get a better understanding of what is driving wave reflection. Um, and this is something I can dive into more, but for now, I'm just going to move on so that we have time for Marcella's um, work. Um, so just a brief summary. Um, we were using an empirical method to convert from DAS strain to pressure, um, and we're able to calculate wave parameters really well in the near shore, which is exciting. Um, and there are still a lot of uncertainties, especially related to um, sort of lower frequency fluctuations, as well as the cross shore variability. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand it off to Marcella um, to talk a little bit about our work in on the Oregon coast. So switching sides of the North American continent. Um, let me just make sure you can share. Okay. Should be good. Okay. okay, can you guys see my screen? Uh, thank you, Hannah. So my name is Marcella Ifu, and I am a first year PhD student working with Megan and Hannah, where we are using DAS to observe different oceanographic processes in the um, ocean. 
So as Hannah stated, our research group has three overarching research goals. So the first one is to quantify the capability of DAS for nearshore sensing. The second is to create a transfer function from dynamic pressure to strain. And then the third research goal is to spatially and temporally correlate the propagation of seabed and sea surface signals. Um, and I will be focusing on the research goal number three. So in order to correlate the signals between the sea surface with the radar, the water column with the acoustic Doppler current profiler, and then the sea floor with the DAS, um, we use these instruments in the Florence, Oregon deployment. So we used a scintilla DAS interrogator unit to do this. To get a visual of um, the sensing regions of these different instruments, the radar senses the sea surface as indicated with the red, and then the ADCP um, collects instruments throughout the water column with yellow, and then DAS is on the sea floor. Um, so in September through October of last year, we had a field experiment off the coast of Florence, Oregon, where we used a telecommunication cable um, that is owned by Alaska Communications, where it comes onshore at Florence and then extends all the way to Anchorage, Alaska. But we only used about the first 50 kilometers of this fiber, as indicated with the yellow fiber path. In addition to the fiber, we deployed two moorings um, adjacent to the fiber that each housed an ADCP and the deeper mooring also housed a hydrophone. And then on shore, there is a radar collecting imagery of the sea surface throughout the latter half of the experiment. The moorings that were deployed adjacent to the fiber had this configuration where we had RBR temperature and pressure sensors that span throughout the entire water column in hopes of capturing waves that travel along density interfaces, so internal waves. Um, and then it connected to the mooring frame that housed an up upward looking ADCP and a hydrophone. Um, so once we collected data from the radar, the ADCP, and the DAS during this field experiment, um, it was time to just visually compare the signatures that we are seeing. So the top panel shows radar data from October 5th. Um, the middle panel shows ADCP data. Um, and then the bottom panel is DAS. So starting off with the radar data, the x-axis is time, and then the y-axis is distance offshore. Um, and radar measures intensity. So within the radar data, we can see individual waves propagating to shore and shoaling as they get closer to shore. And then looking at the second panel is ADCP data through the same time period, but the y-axis is actually depth from the water level. Um, and this does a good job of highlighting the different flow conditions that exist at the water surface and at the sea floor. Um, really highlighting the need to ground truth DAS data because there is that discrepancy in the water column. And then the final um, panel is the DAS data, which measures strain. Um, and it's during the same time period with the y-axis being the same as the radar data, which is offshore distance. And within this, we can also see individual waves propagating to shore and shoaling as they get closer to shore. But if you visually compare the radar and the DAS panels, you can see the same distinct wave group signatures um, amongst both. And we'll get into um, more about the wave grouping, but yeah, it's just really interesting to see the same signals from the sea surface and on the sea floor. Um, so looking at the wave group propagation more closely that we see in the DAS data, I used what Hannah called a wiggle plot, um, where x the x-axis is time and the y-axis is offshore distance. Um, so this is strain at every channel. Um, so 6.4 meters apart is our gauge length. And it really shows um, a wave group formed and then propagating to shore. And the direction is um, shown with the blue line. Another way to look at this is through a pseudo color plot, which is um, the plots that we looked at on the previous slide, where blue indicates positive strain or elongation and red indicates negative strain. 
Um, so this is the same x-axis of time and the same y-axis with offshore distance, but the areas of really high color saturation indicate the presence of a wave group, as you can see when you compare the top panel and the bottom panel. So moving past just visually comparing these um, data streams, I've started to look at them in the frequency domain. So calculating the power spectral density for these three different data streams. Um, so this plot has three different panels with the radar being on the surface, the ADCP in the water column, and then the DAS on the seafloor. Um, the X axis is frequency in Hertz and the Y axis is the respective power spectral density. Um, which has varying magnitudes because the instruments are measuring different things. But one thing that's important is that the peak period is at the same point. So these were computed from data from October 5th, um, 2022. And on this day, we can see that there's a peak period of about 0.07 Hertz, so 14 second waves. Um, but the benefit of DAS is really that it's a sensing array. It's not a point sensor like ADCP. So we can actually track how this power spectral density changes with respect to distance and time um, versus just time, which the radar in ADCP collect. So tracking this power spectral density um, at every channel along the fiber is shown in this figure where the X axis is frequency, the Y axis is offshore distance, um, and then the red triangles indicate the positions of our two moorings, um, the deepest one being in about 50 meters water depth, and then the shallower one in about 20 meters water depth. Um, so we're seeing the power spectral density really increase around the position of our shallower mooring. Um, and this just gives us an indication of okay, the fibers reading um, stronger signals, meaning that the waves are probably feeling the effects of the bottom here um, and essentially entering shallow water around this position. So yeah, that's a great benefit of DAS. Um, and then I'm still in the early stages of really looking through the Florence, Oregon data set, but I'm gonna continue looking at wave group propagation shoreward and seaward, and then I want to start getting into infragravity wave propagation over the Oregon continental shelf. Awesome. Thanks, Marcella. Um, so I am just going to wrap it up um, with some of our like slightly less finished results that um, maybe future directions uh, let me share my screen again. Um, so, oops. Yeah, so I'm just going to wrap up with some future directions. Um, and these are, as Marcel alluded to, we're interested not just in looking in the incident band, um, but both at higher frequency signals as well as infragravity and um, subtitle or even lower frequency signals. Um, so one of the things on sort of the ac near acoustic or acoustic um, range that we've been looking at is sort of the, we think we're seeing signals related to the sound of wave breaking. Um, and this is some work that Rob has been doing. Um, he is one of the main developers of the Argus camera array. And so he loves to include an Argus camera image. Um, just to give you an idea, an immediate idea of what wave conditions are like um, on the in the on the day that the data was collected. Um, so here um, is just an example where once again we see the incoming and reflected waves, um, but also right at the shoreline we see these horizontal signatures. Um, and they show up as horizontal here because we're looking at a relatively long time period um, of uh, five minutes. Um, but we can really zoom in on one of these horizontal signatures, now just showing a few seconds worth of data. Um, so once again, we see the incident waves, um, we see a wave breaking, um, and then we see this signal um, that is propagating um, offshore at like 300 meters per second. So sort of a 
something that's like an acoustic signal probably related to this wave breaking, um, but we haven't really um, dove into the details of what would be generating this and what we can tell about wave breaking. Um, and we're also looking at much lower frequency. Um, so we could look at DAS data. Um, since it's a continuous record, we could take a channel and look um, at tidal or subtidal frequencies. Um, and this is where we're interested in using DAS maybe to look more at the sort of like bed form migration. Um, how does strain change as cable burial depth changes? Um, what's the role of temperature? Um, and we, we have much less of a grasp on these concepts um, at the moment. Um, also just point out that one of the other things that Megan has been um, working on that maybe we can get her to give a talk specifically about is um, the relationship between cable type and strain, um, as well as we've been working on not just an empirical calibration between strain and pressure, but also an analytical transfer function between strain and pressure. Um, and that could be like its whole uh, talk. Um, so I'll just tease that and we can hopefully get Megan to give a talk about it in the future. Um, so with that, um, I will wrap up and we have some time just for a discussion, um, thoughts, questions, ideas, etc. Thanks. So cool, so many cool things. <laughs> Yeah, I have so many questions, but that was really good. Okay. It was very interesting. Awesome. Thanks, Nate. <laughs> um, I was going to ask more about the temperature, but it sounds like you haven't really thought about it more. Do, I mean, do you have temperature records like from the duck experiment? Like, is that at all correlated? Because especially with like that change in time of your correction factor, like it seems like that could be. Have you looked at that at all? Um, we have not looked in detail um so the there is like a a known temperature correction for strain um both for the interrogator unit itself as well as for the cable um mm -hmm. and at duck um we had a custom made cable that had both single mode and multi-mode fibers in it so that we could collect distributed temperature sensing data um in the same cable um, and that's what Kara Walter mm -hmm. is an expert in and has been helping us with. Um, so we do have um, a time series of temperature. Um, it, the gauge length or like channel spacing is different. And I don't remember off the top of my head what it. But it shouldn't vary that much spatially. Yeah, it's exactly. Probably more temporally than spatially. Yeah. And yeah, you get a measurement every five minutes, I think, um, which is like, plenty for us. Um, so yeah, the, my next step is going to be looking at those like lower frequency variations related probably to temperature. Um, and if we can, yeah. in a more quantitative way, take that into account rather than just saying like, we're using a median value. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um, but I also, um, I don't have a great idea of like the relationship both between like the temperature and also cable burial. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I was thinking about that. I mean, because I, anyways, whatever. I don't have a way to deal with it in the Arctic at all because we don't have any seafloor temperature. But with the cable's buried four meters deep. So I think that shouldn't, but I don't know. I mean, it's like even if you have a water temperature, <laughs> no, you convert that to a burial depth temperature. It's tricky. Yeah, something and that's something around, but... that Kara is has a lot more experience with. Um, yeah. there there are these like um, ways to translate between water temperature and temperature at depth. At the cable. Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah. I was wondering about the com um, something like geologists or geophysicists called compliance. I think this is the other um, like Ethan Williams is kind of holding this hypothesis that, that that is what explains that that is the part of the transfer function that you were kind of uh, empirically deriving, um, Hannah, 
and and might be also something that Marcella might might be seeing in the ADCP or in the DAS data. I'm not really sure. Um, but basically, this you know, basically oceanographers would think of you know the ground as a half space, com like no compliance, right? The the strain is basically just the water, you know, wave height, and then the cable is taking up that strain, and nothing's happening below. And the geophysicists say, no, 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 like the w wave height, like you know, and then the ground's going up and down, right? It's, it's all in the sediment and it's in the sand, and um, it ends up being that like the the material properties of the fiber are kind of like their glass, basically the strongest material there, and that ends up being very similar to the um, to a sand, and so it actually ends up being kind of tricky to to set this out. So I guess, do you have any kind of thoughts about the interpretation of this? Like the two communities basically seem like they're kind of <laughs> totally diverging. diverging. Like, I was at a talk this week, and I I brought up that like maybe the oceanographers don't agree. Um, with the compliance hypothesis, and I was basically just shut down, and everyone in the room was like, "Yep, yeah, no, 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 definitely just, uh, just compliance." So fascinating. Um, I have that. I mean, this is like a broader discussion that, like, yeah, we should make sure that our two communities are on the same page about this. I think there is absolutely a compliance signal, and like, um, both compliance and also, um, like water pressure through sand it can be complicated like i think that's part of the signal that we see um in the beach like we i think we can see like um swash backwash and there's like brown water table etc um that also complicate the strain signal observed in addition to the fact that the ground itself yeah is moving um and i don't have a great idea about how to sort of like disentangle those signals. Um, I will say that like um, in the wave tank where we have cables taped to a cement floor, we're seeing a signal that is definitely the pressure gradient from the water. Um, you can let the lab experiments in the place to test that out. Although there's still a question, which I feel like is going to come up in peer review about the compliance of that metal beach. Or the compliance of the plate down at the deeper part of the of the you know wave tank. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, which is also less strong than the sand, I think. Um, or the, sorry, less strong than the fiber. Fiber is pretty strong. Um, yeah. Yeah. But anyway, I don't. It's an interesting problem, and it's really. Can you observe that with the ADCP at all? Like, is, does the ADCP measure like vertical displacements? Like, no. not at the resolution of like a seismometer. Okay. Seems like an OBS or something. Yeah, yeah. I think like an OBS would be the. Um, I guess this is how compliance was developed: is like OBS and pressure sensors kind of having a a delta that was resolved with this compliance concept. Yeah, I guess it'd be also interesting to see like um, in the near shore, like what is the ratio between that compliance signal and this pressure gradient signal? And like maybe one of those is just so dominant that it's not as important and it's really just like a scaling thing based on water depth. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Can you say more about that? What do you, you mean there's a there's a relationship with depth of the wave height, like the the wave height pressure transfer should be should be depth dependent. I mean that that is absolutely true, um, because the the pressure variance is decay that signal is decaying through the water column, um, and so, uh, but I, I was more thinking about like the strain signal recorded by the cable, um, is that signal going to be dominated by the compliance signal or the direct pressure on the cable um, and does that ratio or like which of those factors is more important does that change with water depth or yeah maybe bed material would be a better I don't know yeah I'm curious Maddie what you think 
uh, I don't know, it kind of went off on a tangent in my head as you started talking about this. Sorry, what was the last part you said? I, well, I guess I just like, I'm curious what you overall think about this, like compliance versus like dynamic pressure. I don't know, it seems, yeah, well, I mean, I guess I was wondering, do you see any difference in the quality of your, like, cause I hadn't realized that the results you had in Hawaii, like that that cable is not buried. Does that, I mean, it must mean to see some difference in the response there. Can yeah. A little bit about that. Um, so I can tell you, so we like, we've looked at the very raw data, but currently it's under review at the Navy. So we're like not allowed to actually analyze oh. the data. Um, <laughs> so Annoying. all I can say it basically is that like, there's definitely a change in signal between where it's buried in the sand and where it's just laying over coral reef. Um, and I think it will be a really good data set for looking at that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, but, uh, it's, I only have like, sort of like what I've thought about from like screenshots when we were collecting the data. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It's a good question. A lot to think about. Um, I have another question related to that. Oh, I, no, I have other unrelated questions. I have a lot yeah, of questions. I have one follow-up then, um, just about the compliance. It seems like that, that might be one test is if you had a cable at different depths, different known depths, then, um, the compliance, you could predict the expected strain at those depths. Like unburied, there should be, you know, maybe it's just the surface compliance and then at depth it should be, you know, attenuated because it actually does decay. That that compliance function decays as a function of the burial depth. Um, so you might be able to actually see if it's modeled by the compliance, um, by a compliance type model. Whereas like, I don't know what the pressure model would even predict. I guess the pressure model would somewhat predict like, no change between surface and depth. Just as a function of depth, I guess. Yeah, just as a function of water. Is there depth. tanks where you could, I mean, with sand, where you could test that? Maybe the flume. I, I know Megan was saying that the flume, that she had been involved with some experiments in Oregon where they had trucked in sand and put sand in the flume, and but it was like 30 trucks or something of sand from. <laughs> that yeah. Expensive. I mean, that's something that we've sort of thrown around the idea of like, yeah, so we've done one wave tank experiment with cable on hard cement. Let's put some sand on top. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna grow some ice, grow some ice in there. Yeah, <laughs> to make it really cool. <laughs> um, I, what was the question I was about to ask? Well, I have one question that was just sort of a tangent, but did you actually see internal waves in the Oregon data set? Do you think you can see them on the cable? Um, I mean, so, it sounds like it's maybe too early to say, but. Yeah, I haven't really looked at the RBR data yet, but I've been told that there were some internal waves during the experiment. So I'm excited to get into that, but it's going to be interesting to see if that's even going to show up in the DAS data? I don't know. It's yeah, I guess it's not clear to me like why it would show up in the DAS data. Yeah, yeah. But there's a lot of things that I don't understand about how that's responding to what's happening in the water column. Yeah, it was more mm -hmm. like we're having the temperature like string go through the water column. Why not put RBRs and see what we can see in the DAS yeah. data? Yeah. yeah. In some ways, it's like I don't want it to be responding to all those different things because then all those other oceanographic <laughs> variability changes how you <laughs> calculate the response and the transfer function for surface waves. But I don't know. I guess it just makes it more complicated to separate from that. But yeah. I guess similarly, I was curious with the breaking waves. Like, do you think that that could be? I guess the time I haven't thought through like what the time scale is, but like, could that be one potential reason where you have some periods where it responds or like? where it does less well. I mean, if, I don't know, for example, there's like a period with like a high fraction of breaking and then you would see a lot of additional signal in the cable from that that could skew your spectra. I don't know, yeah. I guess I don't know exactly what that would look like, but. That is a great point. Yeah, so like the location of breaking is going to vary depending on wave conditions and yeah, the amount of yeah. breaking. Um, yeah. So it could impact like different channels at different times more. Exactly. And then I, don't know. I mean, do you think that I guess that's more episodic? So it might not actually like when you're doing it in this frequency space, like maybe it doesn't actually impact the frequencies that you're using to calculate I, those bulk parameters. 
Maybe, mm -hmm. yeah. Or that might be one of the things that's contributing to that temporal variability in the correction yeah. factor. Um, the yeah. other piece that I think we also see in the wave lab, especially, is that um, I think under like in that really, really shallow region, I think we also need to take bed shear stress into account yeah. in strain. Um, so that's something um, by Nate uh, that I am currently trying to think about is sort of the like, yeah, analytically taking bed shear stress into account in addition to pressure gradient. Yeah, that seems hard. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> see how it goes. Yeah. Um, that's something that we might also be able to look at with the Hawaii data set because we also deployed an ADV. Oh, that yeah, that helps. That's cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, we're at we're at nine. I have one so. question. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh, I have another meeting. Oh. Bye, Maddie. <laughs> this is super cool. Sorry. Thanks. So sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm just interested in the uh um. Uh, construction of the uh, significant wave height uh, uh -huh. or uh, pressure from strain uh, through the transfer function. So, uh, I um, and uh, uh, to construct a uh, significant wave height. So, I think the propagation uh, direction of the uh, ocean surface gravity wave is important because the uh, uh, propagation of the uh, infragravity wave uh, should be close to the uh, direction of the cable. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, so is it possible to measure uh, propagation velocity of the ocean surface gravity wave at uh, each segment along the cable? Uh, because uh, if uh, such uh, measured uh, propagation velocity is uh, very close to the theoretical prop propagation velocity of the surface gravity wave, so I think uh, uh, it's a kind of a, a proxy to select a good or about transfer functions. So, I mean, uh, if uh, such measured uh, propagation velocity is different from the theoretical propagation velocity, so in such case, so uh, transfer function is uh, not so good. So, yeah. Yeah, and the, the like wave angle question is something that we're still exploring. Um, and maybe also, yeah, as you're pointing out that, um, that is something that we could measure by looking at the results from multiple channels. Um, mm -hmm. So directly measuring wave angle using DAS strain. Um, we just haven't fully unpacked that yet, but something that we would like to look at in the future. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I just, uh, I, yeah, my idea, my idea is just to, uh, yeah, such a measured propagation velocity uh, beca become a proxy for selecting a uh, Good to or about transfer function. So, and uh, yeah, another question is: uh, Will you deploy some seismometers along the cable? Because uh, yeah, if there is such uh, seismometers, so or uh, we can measure a uh, uh, particle motion, a uh, particle motion direction of the uh, ocean surface gravity wave. And which reflect the uh, propagation direction of the ocean surface gravity wave. So yeah, if, mm. I, so we did not put out any ocean bottom seismometers. Um, oh, yeah. So I think that that may be hard, and especially yeah, thinking about this like com seafloor compliance issue. Yeah. So we we don't have that data, unfortunately. Okay. Yeah. 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 Thank you, thank you so much. Because yeah, yeah no I'm very, very interested in uh, your result because the significant wave height can be constructed from yeah uh, storing data observed by us. Uh, it's it's very surprising. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We're we're really excited about this and hoping to like figure out some of these details soon. Uh, such construction. Uh, uh, it's not depending on the uh, season or uh, uh, daytime or nighttime or something like a uh, temporal variation. Is there yeah, I, I think we see that we can calculate significant wave height through a wide range of dynamic conditions. Um, so certainly not impacted by day or night. Um, 
maybe temperature is causing some of that variability in the correction factor. Um, yeah. But overall, we see that it performs really well through time. Oh, yeah, yeah, I understand. Uh, we also deployed uh, some meters along the cable, and uh, yeah, we calculated the cross correlation efficient, uh, cross correlation, yeah, efficient between the dust data and also uh, temperature data, and uh, uh, we got a good cross correlation coefficient, but uh, um, only in the long period component, maybe uh, um. One or longer than one day or two day or something like that. Yeah. 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 I think, I mean, that, that makes sense. Um, and there are um, like uh, analytical relationships between strain and temperature um, mm -hmm. that we can use to more robustly account for temperature right. variability. And uh, we don't know exactly uh, how, uh, uh, what's the kind of relationship there is uh, between your uh, uh, 100 second to one day or something like that. Yeah. 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 So much potential for future research. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And awesome. I, agree, I agree with you. <laughs>